Welcome to the OrthoClips podcast series. Uh, today, the title of our topic is Keys to Success with the Masculet Technique. And our guests are Dr. Benjamin Taylor, Fellowship Director of the Orthopedic Trauma Fellowship at Grant Medical Center, Columbus, Ohio. He's also Associate Program Director for Ohio Health Orthopedic Surgery Residency and Associate Clinical Professor at Ohio University. We also have uh, my colleague, Dr. David Gallos, Assistant Professor of Orthopedic Surgery and Sports Medicine at the Lewis Katz School of Medicine at Temple University here in Philadelphia. Thank you both for joining today on the podcast. Thanks for having us. Great. I'll start with, uh, with you, Dr. Taylor. Um, why don't you just introduce us real quick to the Masculet technique? What is it and what are the indications? So, sure, the masculine technique, or also known as the induced membrane technique, is a method by really filling in big areas of bone loss. So the big indications for that would be tumor, trauma, or infection. Anything where you get these critical defects, we need to fill with something. Otherwise, whatever construct we're using is doomed to fail. So in this technique, uh, it kind of discovered by uh, Dr. Masculet from France, a plastic surgeon, Uh, put in cement spacers, PMMA spacers, into large bony defects and uh, treated the infection. And then once adequate uh, debridement was done, proceeded with bone grafting into the basically membrane or the gaps that were created by placement of the PMMA. Okay. Um, How good is the evidence to support its use? Uh, The evidence, most of this, you have plenty of... uh, Uh, level three, level four type studies on this, large case series, uh, meta-analyses of these case series there. And so uh, the descriptions are are pretty good. The uh, technique itself is well described in many of these and uh, success rates in a recent meta-analysis was just uh, under 90%. Okay. Um, So let's get into the topic here. What are some of the keys to success with this technique? Um, Dr. Gallus, what are um, what are some of your keys to success when you do this? I think um, number one, getting adequate control of any potential infections, getting any and all devitalized bone out of the area, um, is typically the first step um, to uh, having a successful outcome. I think beyond that, um, having your member your uh, your cement spacer taking up the entire bone void. And as Dr. Taylor had mentioned during our lecture series earlier today, having the bone ends covered by the cement is very helpful as the membrane that forms due to the foreign body reaction that the body has to the cement is helpful to uh, create union spanning the entire bone defect. Okay. Dr. Taylor, you want to step in? Yeah, sure. Some of your keys? Yeah, I would echo the biggest risk for this failing is infection. So if we look at all of the studies, the uh, odds ratio and relative risk of infection uh, causing failure is, is really the prime determinant. So making sure we have an adequate debridement. Dr. Masclay himself does not put any antibiotics into the cement because he doesn't want to hide any infection. Many studies and many centers, including ours, uh, continue to use antibiotics to hopefully uh, prophylax or even treat any infection we may have missed. So that's a whole argument in itself. But I think the adequate debridement, and sometimes this requires several trips back to the OR to ensure this has happened, uh, I think that is probably the largest key to success there. Uh, You mentioned placement of the spacer. This should be a a fairly homogenous, solid uh, piece of cement that we make here. And so if we piecemeal this, the membrane that forms around this is also going to be uh, exactly like that and very difficult to take out uh, even in a piecemeal fashion. So it should fill up the void in the intended area we're trying to fill. Uh, stability of the bone is also important. Uh, the animal studies show without any fixation or stability to this, it does not form an adequate membrane. Uh, if we're using external fixator for temporary or trying to turn that into definitive treatment there, uh, after we remove the X-fix, we have a higher rate of refracture through that new area we worked so hard to get to heal. So with that, uh, we, don't, we don't have the protection of something like a nail or a plate that we leave in dwelling to allow this to mature over a longer length of time uh, than a native normal fracture would. Okay. Um, 
I guess in a similar vein, my follow-up question is, what are some of the problems or challenges you've faced with this method? Uh, maybe things that were just um, technical challenges or perhaps things that you learned from a case that didn't go well um, that you've sort of improved along the way. Dr. Gallus, back to you. Well, I think, um, number one, it is it is uh, inherently a two-stage procedure, so that does present some challenges for the patient. They should understand that going in just from a patient communication perspective. But also, I think to adequately debride and adequately place your spacer, it does require a more extensile and uh, larger approach than what you would maybe need if you were just um, you know, doing this in a, in a different uh, technical way. So having you know, beyond an exposure that goes beyond the intact bone ends is important. So your exposure is going to be much larger. Um, and so from that perspective, I think um, that could present some challenges um, as well. Um, Dr. Keller, anything? Additional? Um, I think the other important part that comes to mind would be the importance of soft tissue coverage. And so working together with plastic surgery, or even if you're adequate and adept at uh, doing rotational flaps, that's something where if we can increase the biology to the area there, the membrane can be more robust as that area has a lot more vitality. So trying to skimp on that side of things and just focus on the bone, I think is a mistake. I think this is looking, you have to step back, look at the big picture and try to get the vascularity there increased. So uh, you mentioned the debridement again, I'd reiterate and hit that one again. If the area is not adequately debrided and you're not comfortable with that, or you haven't enlarged your approach, like you mentioned, uh, I think you're setting yourself up at a higher risk for failure. So uh, that's a important point. I think yeah, I would reiterate again and again and again. Um, the social side of things adds another twist to some of these patients don't always make the best choices in life and that's how they got into this situation. Uh, so talking to them, like you uh, noted, is important, but then also trying to ensure these patients follow up. You know, the cement and putting that in there is structurally sound, but it can't heal, it can't uh, uh, fix itself. So that's going to start crumbling and eroding away with time and whatever fixation you have in there, whether it's a nail, a plate, or external fixator uh, is going to fail. So we need to go back and we have to do that second stage. So working with the patients in the social side of things to make sure that they actually can follow through on that part. So sticking on that point, um, just to follow up, can you think of cases that were, or maybe someone you did or was referred to or whatever, um, where the indication maybe wasn't the best. So, you know, just to help our listeners understand maybe when not to do, I mean, we understand that you don't, you want to eliminate and minimize, mitigate the risk for infection, but what's a case that maybe you've seen indicated for masculine that really wasn't the best choice and then ultimately maybe should have been treated differently or was treated differently? Um, well, I think sometimes, uh, these very large critical bone defects with um, with a soft tissue envelope is not the best, and reconstruction of the soft tissue envelope is not. Um, there aren't very many good viable options. I think doing a big extensile approach with multiple procedures through that same environment that that scenario I think is is maybe a challenge and maybe something I would want to avoid and maybe use a different kind of technique. There's, there's different techniques to regenerating bone and making bone, um, including a bone transport with a Lizarov or even uh, uh, all inside um, intramedullary uh, extendable uh, nails um, that may be, um, from an approach perspective, may help avoid some of the soft tissue problems if patients aren't good candidates for flap coverage. And so those are the types of situations where I would, we, you know you're gonna have to go in and out of the wound multiple times, and if the wound is at risk, and they don't have good flap options, then that might be one I would try to avoid doing a mascalay on. Yeah, and I can think of cases I've had where we planned for mascalay, and we didn't really talk that much right now about timing, you know, mm -hmm. ideal timing um, of, of mascalay, and maybe you can comment on that, uh, Dr. Taylor, but um, when you plan to go back, the flap that was done, maybe it just isn't ready to go back. And I've had conversations with plastic surgeons who are like, you really sort of 
you know, putting this, you know, this flap at risk if we go and elevate it now. I know you wanted to go back at, you know, four to six weeks or whatever, but this is not going to end well. So then sometimes, yeah, for that reason, I, I've maybe emasculate wasn't necessarily the wrong choice in that case, but um, it alters the timing. But you're right, the, the soft tissue coverage maybe could make it difficult to do these type of two-stage things. Any, any other sort of indication concerns you want to bring up? Um, I think the bigger issue there is the salvage or not question. And so, of course, as surgeons, we like to try to save things and help people. And sometimes uh, you can get stuck in the concept that uh, amputation is a loss when necessarily, you know, for certain situations, actually, that's the best outcome the patient can get. So I think trying to apply this to uh, someone with maybe worse protoplasm, vascular you know, compromise, uh, dirty wounds or infections that are recalcitrant to debridements and IV antibiotics. I think trying to push forward uh, with something like Mascalay or any of the other techniques Dr. Gallus mentioned, I think is probably uh, not the best idea. So I think it's a tool in your toolbox, but doesn't necessarily mean we have to use it for everyone. Interesting. All right. Well, um, but before we wrap up, I do want to ask one other question, Was which is wh what do you think is the future for uh, improving this technique or maybe extending the indications? Um, what do you guys envision or hope that uh, we'll be able to do in the next you know, five years or perhaps a little longer? I think if you could create a one-stage situation instead of a two-stage situation, uh, that would be nice if we put something in and around our graft that we could put in right at the get-go, uh, created this membrane that protected it or whatever we're putting around there in itself would be adequate to protect. It would also help nourish and prevent any ingrowth from any of the scar tissue from the outside, from the muscle and fascia and on. So I think if you could create a reliable system like that, uh, similar to, you know, we wrap a lot of nerves, we repair those. And so some of the technology and concepts are evolving, but uh, that's really one that uh, is not quite ready for prime time yet. So there's been candidates even since the mid sixties that have been around and tried, and especially in animal models, uh, a lot in the maxillofacial sp uh, space as well. So I don't see any of those have succeeded to this point to where we're ready for prime time, like I said. So I think that would be the biggest thing I would like to go to. I think the second thing that comes to mind is the chemistry. So, you know, adding whatever concoction we can in terms of uh, absolute amounts, uh, timings, BMPs, maybe it's altering the interleukins. Uh, you know, I think the chemistry we don't really understand to a point enough to know what else needs to be added there. There's data looking at BMP 7s worse. Another paper says it does a little bit better. Uh, BMP 2, adding that, has been worse in other papers. So I think our knowledge of how this membrane works biochemically is still in the infancy. So if we can figure out how to really direct that further, I think that gives us plenty of options at uh, improving it as is right now, but also then maybe leading into that one stage where if we can create a membrane, now we have the chemistry to play with it and we can inject something, you know, similar, we inject PRP, whatever this concoction may be, whatever the timing may be, being able to match that even to what the patient needs for their defect. Yeah, I think there's a lot of future in injectable regenerative um, biotechnologies in the future and, you know, in medicine in general. So this could possibly be one of them. Any final thoughts, Dr. Gallus, for the listeners? Yeah, one, I mean, the other thing is after, you know, as we said before, the, the cement spacer itself is fairly stable for a finite time period. But after that, when you remove it and you have the bone graft in there, there is a time period when the bone is somewhat unprotected, even though you have implants in there. Um, so having something that might be, have some structure to it to allow for perhaps some earlier weight bearing, as some of the studies show, um, weight bearing can be delayed up to even four months after this, depending on how the healing is going. Um, that, you know, I think that that could be something that might be helpful as well to make it a little bit more palatable to some of the patients. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good point. And, uh, you know, I've used the fibula strut and it's been written up now, a small series and people realizing that aspect of it where you don't have that stability for that time after you take the cement out. Essentially, now you have a known gap defect and uh, trying to add on something like a strut or whatever else we can come up with to 
augment that stability. Uh, oftentimes we'll throw another plate on there, but then that's more operative time, potentially more morbidity for that patient. So uh, yeah, if you could have something that'd be stable, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah I mean, these are tough cases. You know, we're trying to save limbs, and I think the masculine technique is uh, certainly something that uh, we have as an option to help our patients. Seems like we still have a little bit to learn. Um, but that was a great discussion. I want to thank uh, my guests again, uh, Drs. Taylor and Dr. Gallos. We've been talking about keys to success with masculine technique. Uh, thank you again. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.